Okay, so for today, we're going to be talking with Nick Snow 2 over here. Hello. And the reason that I wanted to do a video uh, about his climb is because, first of all, he just had such a rapid climb and improvement um, over such a short period of time. So I thought it'd be really helpful to, for everyone to kind of get a perspective on, you know, what he did and how he did it. And also because he, he had Challenger and it's kind of a, a great milestone both for him uh, and for me for being able to help someone reach Challenger because it's it's so early on in my coaching that I really want to figure out like what actually happened. <laughs> right. And so if we can learn as much as possible from Nick today, I think that'll be really good for everyone to see. So welcome, Nick. What I want uh, from you to begin with is just to give a, a brief you know, introduction of yourself and your history with league, you know, like how long you've been playing, what your journey like kind of leading up to this has, has looked like. Sure. Um, so I'm Nick. I'm 19. i um, been playing the game for like probably six or seven years. Um, so yeah, I started pretty young. Um, <clears throat> like when I first joined the uh, Euro Coaching Discord, I was in like high diamond, low master sort of situation. And then now three, four months later, I'm challenger. Um, before I joined, I sort of bounced around between roles. I played mid and jungle in sort of that high diamond to low master range um, yeah. for selling out support. And I mean, yeah, I also play competitive amateur sort of thing in NA. It's pretty fun. But, yeah, yeah, cool. So what made you decide on support for the long run? Mm, I don't know. I just really like it, honestly. I think at the end of the day, roles don't really matter. It's all the same game. It's just whatever you really click with and the support just kind sure. of clicked with me. So yeah, cool. I wouldn't say there was any particular reason other than that. Okay. All good. Um, and so you were, you spend most of your time around D1 and master and yep. then this season you've just been, you've absolutely ballooned up to 900 plus LP. Yep. Right? I guess. Yeah. Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. Um, Okay, so let's start to dive into that and how that sure. happened. And the first point that I want to start with is mentality, because I'm a big advocate for taking care of both your gameplay and your mentality. And yeah. I hope it resonates with everyone how important that both of these are. Um, yeah. So for mentality, how do you approach um, performance? You know, how do you find ways to consistently perform? Because a lot of what it takes to be and stay at the top is about consistency. Right. Um, in, in my opinion. And so, yeah, how did walk us through how you approach performance, how you find uh, ways to improve and learn and stay on top of your mental game? Sure. Um, I think originally, um, like before I sort of uh, joined your coaching stuff, I had a lot of issues with mental because often, um, you know, I'd queue up, I'd, I'd win or I'd lose whatever. And then I'd after I look past or back up the game and I just wouldn't really know what happened. Um, and that's really frustrating, to be honest. Like when you lose mm. and you don't know why, that's the worst thing. You know, teammates, whatever sure. it is, what it is. But I think just the knowledge gap is really the difference. So I'd say that so was you knew, kind of the. Yeah, did, did you know that something was missing? Like yes, you knew I just that... didn't know what. Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and that's okay. really frustrating. I think so. Yeah. That was probably the biggest mental challenge I had. Um, in terms of how to stay on top of that, I mean, obviously, I think being able to have that resource of. <laughs> You know, bringing a bot in and getting coached and being able to see sort of the holes in the gameplay definitely helped a lot um, because it just sort sure. of alleviated that issue entirely. Um, yeah. And then also I'd say just sort of seeing it as like a long-term process. And, you know, one game is one game, you know, 10 games, like whatever. It doesn't matter, right? At the sure. end of the day, as long as you're... A game's always a win if you're learning something, right? So at the end of the day, that's kind of just how I look at it. And yeah. And is that something that you've always had um, or has it been something that has developed more strongly since your climb? Um, or... I'd say it's definitely developed for sure. Because again, going back to what I said, like it's kind of hard to learn something when I didn't know what was going around. Do you know what I mean? So I think now that sure. I have a, a more like solid basis and understanding the game, it's a lot easier to have that approach. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, from what you say, it sounds like the main gap was just the game knowledge, which yeah. is yeah. a coach's dream. If I can just, Fill in some game knowledge and then you can take that and just run with it and that's right. amazing so yeah if you had the foundation of like a solid mental as well you know you, i a lot of my videos talk about the, the long-term approach to right. learning and so you don't focus on the immediate results you're able to see the bigger picture you're able to take learning um and have that as your primary goal you know not to be right. the highest rank in your friends group not to have uh 
high highs with wins, low lows with losses. It's really about uh, emotional regulation. And it's something right. that has struck me about you that we can really just kind of get to the, the meat and bones sure. of how to improve. Yeah. Um, cool. And so the next point I want to talk about quickly is out of game. And so obviously there, there are a lot of players and pros that just have no respect for out of game whatsoever. And so it's, it's not a hundred percent necessary to climb to, you know, really put a lot of effort and attention into your out of game, you know, like diet, right. sleep, health, exercise. Um, but I just wanted to get your, your take on it and how you incorporated that if at all into your journey so far. Um, I think at the end of the day, it all just kind of comes down to do whatever you need to, to be able to be as intense as possible, as focused as possible. Um, so for me, uh, I guess at the beginning of my climb, I wasn't really managing a lot of my out of game stuff. And then towards the tail end, you know, I was going to the gym. I, I go swimming as well. Um, you know, drinking more water, getting better sleep. It, it all helps. And it may not directly make you better at the game, but it will allow you to focus a lot more. Right. And that just sort of gives you sure. so much more room to work with, you know? Um, yeah, definitely. But yeah. And also just sort of having like a, an outlet. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. Sort of, you know, if you have a bad day or whatever, it, it's nice to be able to, you know, go to the gym or whatever, whatever works for you, I guess, you know? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a very big advocate for that as well. And if I yeah. ever queue up <clears throat> for a game where I'm not focused 100%, then I, it really upsets me, like on a yeah. personal level. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, this is just a, a concept that everyone will just have to keep in mind because the generation of pro players in the highest level, they all, well, most of them don't really respect the out of game. And right. it's impossible to tell how much better they could have been or how much more consistent they could be if they did take care of these things. I yep. just, a lot of pros have not climbed, you know, <laughs> 1000 LP in half a year. So yeah, for sure. Bringing up. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Now let's have a quick talk about process. So, you know, routines of practice, if you warm up or how often you look to play, do you play in blocks? How, how do you structure? What was your process like? To uh, yeah. So usually like, so before it scrims and whatever, cause I do play amateur and then before like blocks to slow queue, I just kind of like to do like this exercises that I found on YouTube. It's nothing really special. And then I also, yeah. Um, I found that like running my hands under warm water for like 30 seconds to yeah. a minute before I play and just kind of massage my hands up felt really good. I guess it kind of like yeah. just primed me to play. I don't know. Warm hands are OP. <laughs> yeah. Um, <same. laughs> yeah. Uh, other than that, in terms of blocking, I usually aim to play one or two, two blocks a day. I'd say probably. Yeah. I think that for me, that's worked the best to be able to have like a lot of focus and yeah. Okay. I, I don't that... think spamming is a good idea generally, but yeah. No, same. <clears throat> is that number something that you have kind of developed through uh, trial and error? Have you played yeah. longer blocks and then you've found that you, you suffered some repercussions? Yeah. So originally, um, you know, I was watching Coach Curtis and stuff like this and, you know, three blocks are kind of their main like mantra, right? And for mm -hmm. me, it just always felt like, I don't know, it just felt like two blocking work better for me. It's probably a personal thing. I just like the shorter, more intense sessions. Um, yep. I think either way, the goal is the same, right? Just to have a consistent schedule and, you know, not spam. But sure. uh, yeah, yeah I, just, I just personally work better for me. So yeah, for sure some trial and error there. Yeah. yeah. And I think something worth talking about both for people who are listening and for myself is how do you deal with, if you're only playing two games at a block and the first game, you know, it could potentially be less focused or a bit sloppier. Right. Do you approach the first game any different or do you, do you think that, um, you still do struggle a little bit more in the first game of a block, or do you think like the warming up physically of your hands helps out? What do you think? Mm, I see what you're saying. I guess generally I try to only play when I feel like I'm like mentally ready and focused, and I sort of yeah. take care of all the out of game stuff beforehand to make sure that I'm I am mentally ready. Um, and then I think yeah, the out of game stuff in terms of uh, you know warm ups and whatever does help me prime my mechanics. So. Mm. I personally wouldn't say I, I had that issue too much just because I felt like I did have a big priority on taking care of everything at a game first. Do you know what I mean? Okay. But okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I just want to get your perspective on something else. So for sure. me personally, if I play more than two or definitely more than three games in a block, I just start to get mentally exhausted. Yeah. And it's one of two reasons. Either I try extremely hard to make the best decision regardless and have a really strong mental and that drains me. 
right. or I just don't have the the mental fortitude to maintain that intensity for very long. So, what do you think that factors in at all to your like two blocks or? What do you think happens in your case? Yeah, I, no, I, I definitely think so. I think once I sort of started working more with you and getting into the mindset of like controlling the game, um, like as an individual, it definitely becomes a lot more draining and it's harder to mm. play more for sure. Um, yeah. Just because you have to be evaluating so many things, right? And sure. yeah, so I think for sure, yeah. Because mm. if, if you're just autopilot and queuing up, it's not a lot really easier. focusing on much, yeah. you can play like 10 games and, and kind of easily, be easily. Yeah. yeah. So that, no, that, that's cool. Um, all right, so let's talk about what actually makes a good student. Sure. And I thought you'd be a, a fantastic example because, like, we we barely have worked together for that long. It's, yeah, it has not crazy. been a, a long time for sure. No, <laughs> like, like something clicked, and every uh, you know, every session that we did spend together, it, you must have taken something away at, on a meaningful level and just really run. Yeah, it. yeah, for sure. And so. How about you, you just give me your idea of what, what you think or how what helped you to get the most out of these sessions Okay. and what you think a good student would generally look like. Okay. I think for me personally, I think I was able to extract so much value because I was being really critical with everything you said. I really was intentional to not let anything you said like roll off my shoulder sort of thing. I was very you mean like damage your ego? Um. I guess like I wanted it to damage my ego. Oh. Like I, I, I didn't I didn't want to let anything slip past. Do you know what I mean? I was unwilling to okay. accept like, okay, maybe I just, you know, I was not focused, I made a mistake or whatever. I'm not gonna make this mistake mm. the next time. It's like, no, like this is a fundamental misunderstanding. We need to fix this immediately. Right. Okay. And I was I was yeah. very intentional about that and making sure that everything we talked about, I like I wanted to imp implement it and improve on it, which is why I think for me, I would go back and watch the recordings of recessions like one or two times every time and go back and just try and get as literally as much value as I can uh, out okay. of every one. Um, yeah, I'd say the other thing is not being afraid to ask stupid questions. I feel like I've asked you a lot of stupid questions in DMs or in sessions. And at the end of the day, it's like, who cares? You know, it, if, right. if you're unwilling to, you know, drop your ego and accept that you don't know everything, right? Mm -hmm. You're never going to yep. learn, you know? So, definitely. Yeah. So it's about so far we've got. <clears throat> like not letting your ego getting in the way of improvement yeah. and looking to be as self-critical and take as much, as much responsibility as possible on yourself to improve. Yeah. Which is obviously easier said than done. These For are qualities sure. that like we can just kind of throw around. Um, but was there anything th th this could just be completely wrong, but was there anything that, uh, you know, helped you or influenced you to adopt this mind frame, or was this just something that you, Nick has had? Um, no, I, I don't definitely don't think this was my original mindset. I mean, as I, as I told you, I did have mental issues in the past mm. before, and even if it was rooted in misunderstanding, I think it did lead me down dangerous paths of sort of like you know not being willing to accept accountability because I didn't know what to be accountable for. Do you know what I mean? Right. So I, I'd right. say for sure, yeah. like getting the better knowledge, improving my mindset with you, it mm. definitely led me down that path, yeah. It definitely not okay. intrinsic, I think, yeah. Sure. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm going to give my uh, observations of our, our brief time together. I'm not, I'm not even sure, sure how many sessions we've had together exactly. Probably but... less than 10, I'd say. Something yeah, like that, yeah, yeah. Around, around that number. Yeah. <laughs> sure, um, yeah. So what made my job so easy with you is that, you know, you, you just get it. You understand that we're here... We're on the same page. We're, we're here for the same reason, to help you try and get as good at the game as possible. And that's right. your genuine priority. Yeah. Some students, they they, they want that, but it's, it's not their first priority. Like some would yeah. want to just like, you know, have a chat or some want an echo chamber. Some talk sure. about their views and philosophies too much. And it's like, I'm, I'm trying to help you yeah. develop those into yeah. better yeah. views and philosophies. Yeah. And also obviously... I, I'm not perfect whatsoever. I've, I've only been doing this for like half a year and sometimes I miss things. Sometimes I could come off the wrong way and it felt like you were very charitable in that sense, like understanding where I'm coming from. I'm not yeah. here just to, you know, talk shit and beat you down. Like I'm, I'm really for trying sure. to help provide structure and yep. the, the absolute best students I've had in Europe up there is like really embraces that and it feels like we're, we're on a, a journey together. Yeah, I agree. I, I definitely think that 
it definitely feels like we're on the same page in terms of our goals and mm. stuff whenever i bring a, a vod in or whatever yeah yeah for sure um so yeah just really trying to be on the same page to find that uh the best gameplay and mentality for your journey and the, the no ego flaring up with mistakes so i felt some sometimes you know i, I try to you know adjust my session to the student if they're not taking things right. well then i try a different approach but I've, I've been able to be very upfront with you and your ego hasn't flared up yeah and even if i try to downplay a mistake you're right there saying no that's important yeah it's, no i mean not <laughs> past that yeah. yeah yeah um okay no that's that's good um so what i wanted to talk about next and i, I feel like this might be one of the most important points to discuss for everyone watching there is We've talked briefly about your mentality and a little bit about how you've developed um, over the course of your climb, mm -hmm. but I would love to know the biggest problems you've had to overcome because you say, you say you were, you know, stuck low master, high D1 for quite a long time. And there must've been some obstacles, either main mentality or gameplay or both that, you know, really allowed you to reach that next level quickly. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I think the biggest one um, was essentially shifting my mindset from okay what can i do as an individual player to win this game like what what can i do individually the best i can to win to what can i do to like bring the team together get everyone on the same page and sort of work with my team to be able to win and that's mainly going to come through pings and communication right because before i that was something lacking in my gameplay i really didn't put any focus on that at all and i think mm -hmm. that's probably the biggest change because i genuinely feel like now i'm able to control games um even mm -hmm. like outside of my role and what I do as an individual. Um, so yep. for sure that. And then I'd say um, another big issue is later on in my climb, sort of similar, was that we were, or I, I was having confidence issues in the sense of, I was sort of scared to ping certain players. Um, <laughs> I know we yeah. watched your bot where I was playing with double lift and, you know, that was a big sort of learning for me that, you know, no matter who I'm playing with, like I gotta, I gotta know that my view of the game I got to be able to communicate that no matter who I'm playing with. Right. Yeah. So that was definitely exactly. a big hurdle as well. Um, yeah. yeah. And then I, I guess I would also say that my mentality just in general, um, like before I, I work with you, I definitely had some mental issues and mm. sort of overcame them um, through the stuff we talked about earlier. So yeah, I'd say those are sort of my biggest learnings overall. Okay. So on the mentality front, it sounds like the biggest personal development you went through was really being able to hyper-focus on what's in your control and that yeah. includes working with your team for uh, sure the, the communication aspect yeah i want to give my uh my perspective on a couple of points that you have brought up because i'm resonating with them as well and obviously okay. i didn't just start out high yeah. high level <laughs> player and everything right um so at the start of 2018 i had a, a similar experience that that you had in terms of like i was aware of this knowledge gap and right. i had you know the personality and the confidence to be a shot caller and to communicate i just didn't know you know some right. like my teammates or coach want me to to shot call and it's like you you, you need to have both the, the personality the, the confidence the leadership yeah. and the knowledge and right. i had to the only way i developed was uh through six months of the first split of just non-stop vod reviewing and just getting right. into the details and pushing past the ego and not like leaving no stones unturned and really just putting in the hard yards to get that game knowledge. Sure. The next point is the like communicating with your team. And sure. what I what I did in like early on in my pro career is I didn't treat solo queue with much respect. And mm. I really struggled to communicate. I was like the extreme of just well, what what you were saying before, do what is in just just do like make sure that you make the best decisions, but right. not like getting on the same page with the team, not, you know, communicating and potentially embracing reality and going with the flow. Right. It was a, a very arrogant approach that I did have where it was just like, I know what should happen. I'm going to pretend that it is going to happen. If it doesn't, then everyone sucks. And yeah. <laughs> I was I was just kind of like stuck in master, didn't play the game like whatsoever. Right. So th that's been personally one of the biggest revelations that I've had. And I, I can see that it does, you know, resonate with a lot of students. And it sounds like you as well in terms of actually acknowledging that communicating is fully within your control and can make an yeah. absolute huge difference i'd say that's I'm probably sure one of the least talked about fundamentals i think like across mm. coaching in general i no one talks about it but it's, a, it's yeah. very important yeah definitely yeah so no it's cool to see like these similarities in our journey 
kind yeah. of pop up. So maybe there is some some substance to that. Um, okay, so we've talked about the biggest problems you've had to overcome. I'm happy to move on from that soon. I just wondered if any of that translated to like in-game problems or what was it mostly the mental hurdles that we have talked about? Um, yeah, I think like in the game, an issue I had due to like a like a fundamental lack of knowledge is I was generally um, like near the server sessions. I was scared <clears throat> to take the space I, I deserved. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't I, I didn't want to make the, I didn't want to be the one making the mistake. So I'd rather underplay and then I'm never going to get blamed for anything. Right. And that was sort of another right. big sort of shift in my gameplay. The, the thought process of I'd rather overplay and then back off than underplay and never learn anything. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Um, yeah, definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. So making mistakes versus missing opportunities. I, yeah. I'm not sure if I brought up with that with you too much because we haven't had like that many sessions at all. Yeah. But that's definitely something that I encourage. I, yeah. I have like two ways of talking about it. Um, pushing uh, the envelope, testing the limits, and then figuring out what those limits actually are. Yeah. And then updating your, your knowledge so that you know how to react to situations better. You know, if you never yeah. tried out, you never learn. For sure. And a lot of students <clears throat> that I have taught, I see so many missed opportunities and not too many glaring mistakes, you know? Right. That any kind of conflict or decision tree happens and then they just take the safe path and they don't want anything right. to do with it and they can never learn an update. So it, it sounds like you really embraced uh, taking that opportunity, testing it out and then learning. Yeah, yeah I, I think I can kind of like resonate with that because it's very easy to sort of take the, the easy route, right? Because if you're never getting pinged, you're never going to have any painful experiences like, okay, I can move on game to game and never actually take accountability for anything, right? Yeah. Whereas if you're willing to actually take that risk and, you know, push the envelope and actually like value your development, um, mm. I mean, it, it's hard, right? It's going to be painful, but Definitely. I think it's very important. I think you have to be willing to make that sacrifice to, you know, your ego, I guess, basically. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And it ties right into that long-term approach to your yeah. learning so that you maybe in this one situation, maybe in this one game, it hurts your chances of winning, but right. <clears throat> for yourself as a player and for every game in the future, it, it adds to your chances of winning. It adds to your for knowledge sure. and your skill. Right. Okay. The next point I wanted to briefly touch on is the teachings from our, our sessions, you know, my coaching things that maybe have stuck with you the most that could help people listening and also help me figure out how to be a better coach as well. Sure. Yeah. I'd say, this is going to be like decently similar to what I said last time, but again, mm -hmm. the, the biggest thing is going to be um, learning how to control the game through pings. And then um, I also want to talk about like just in general, being a giga chat, you know, not being afraid to, <laughs> to you know, make a mistake now. And because really that's also who you should be, right? Um, at the end of the day, an individual game means literally nothing, right? In the grand scheme yeah. of things, as long as you're actually taking something away, whatever you have to do to achieve that, that's all that matters. So for me, you know, if, whatever, I, I'll be a giga chat. I don't care. I'll, I'll test something out and I'll <laughs> learn from it, right? Like who cares, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I'd say those two things are probably the biggest takeaways from this year content in general. Yeah. So the, the, the communicating part of that ace mentality, doing everything yeah. in your control, acknowledge the best play, communicate the best play and embrace reality afterwards. Um, and then just really embracing that long-term approach. Yeah. I guess I would also say, in terms of like specific champions, it felt really mm. nice because um, beforehand when I played support, I just kind of showed up to lane and I, I knew like specific micro interactions in the lane, like for example, like not also lane, you know, hooking her out of her E, but I didn't yep. really have like a, a framework for how I wanted to play the lane on each specific champion. And I think that's another thing I learned um, very quickly by working with you and just sort of having that general idea of, okay, you know, the first three waves, this is my general, like generally what I want to do. I want the lane to look okay. like this. This is what looks good for me, right? I can achieve this by, you know, whatever, right? Like, let's say talk about Renata. Mm. Okay, I want to contest push level one, right? I want to be playing around my, my E cooldown, right? Like all these things, sort of just having this formulated process in my brain makes it super easy yeah. to play. And I didn't have that before for sure. So, yeah. Okay, so kind of like having a blueprint with what you want to do. Yeah. Having an underlying structure. Yeah. So that if everything goes slowly and smoothly, you're comfortable. Yeah. But then you also are fully uh, embracing of chaos and skirmishes that yeah. come along. Because I sometimes... Mean, that's what I, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Sometimes, like, uh, quite a few of my students have, like, they are almost addicted to structure and order. And they want slow 
methodical. They don't want confrontation. They don't want anything to happen outside of a, you know, a neat framework, right. but it feels like you embrace both elements of the game, uh, yeah. the, 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 the order and the chaos. And sure. I feel like it's, it's part of the coach's job to provide as much order and structure as possible, but to also advocate for, you know, the, it is never going to go always as planned and you need to be right. able to adapt in the moment. Right. Um, Okay, so I, I wanted to pick your brains a little bit on how you might. Do you have any theories or ideas about how you might bring about this type of mentality? And others, like maybe, have you talked about your climb or your mentality to like friends or uh, teammates? Yeah. I think I think it's hard um, to sort of like for you as a coach to encourage a student to do it. I, I really think mm -hmm. it's something you have to do personally. I, I, I don't think um, like no matter how much I tell someone, you know, to go to the gym, it doesn't matter until they have sort of the personal, um, I guess, debate with themselves and figure out that that's, you know, do you truly want to improve? Are, are you willing to put mm -hmm. in the effort? Are you willing to make sacrifices, you know, to go, mm -hmm. to, you know, stuff like this? Like, is that really what you want? And I, I really don't, I'm not sure it's possible for as an outside party to sort of encourage that. I I've tried, I've tried to help my yeah. friends, but it's hard, man. I, I really think it's something you have to do personally and sort of mm. figure that out for yourself and, you know, have that discussion with yourself. Why are you playing the game? Right. Did you really, yeah. you know, do you want this or are you sort of here to coast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I fully agree with that. You can't help someone unless they don't want the help. Yeah. And even though there's like, kind of like a, a, a hidden underlying premise that, you, you're signing up for coaching that means you want to get better. It's not necessarily always the case, right? Maybe sometimes sure. you're just going through the motions to tell yourself that you're doing something, but you're not really committed to the cause. Yeah, no, 100%. So, mm, yeah, so if, you, if you're there for the right reasons, if you put in the work, results are very likely to follow. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree with that for sure. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so in terms of moving forward for yourself, you've climbed an insane amount um your your top I, i'm not, not sure of your rank but you're you're upwards of 900 lp at the moment yeah right? i'm uh top 210 in na right now and i'm yep. 910 lp yep sure so what's what's your journey looking like at the moment and for the near future what are you looking to achieve if if you're looking at anything outside of your journey what, what's what's next for nick here um well right now i'd say my journey currently sort of slowed down a little bit i i moved up for university so just kind of getting back in the groove but fully intend on getting back on the on the ground today actually after this so that'll be hype okay um awesome. <laughs> but in terms of uh, my long term or sort of like just my goals for the future um mm. right now by the end of the season goal is 1.1 1.2 klp um which would put me like top 100 na a little higher than that um that's sort of my goal in silicon and then eventually uh i am aspiring to play professionally so yeah, mm -hmm. I hope that, you know, we can continue grinding away and making sure they're insane, as we said. So definitely. Yeah. And this is this is a journey that we're on and yeah. there is no end point. Right. We're both For improving sure. off of each other. And if you ever get complacent, you know, you could have been complacent hitting challenger. You know, you could have right. shown that shiny new rank around and then just like started playing ARAMs. But <laughs> it's it's a journey. Right. right. And we're, we can always improve on ourselves. That's the beautiful thing. For and sure. If you are if, if that's. If you have the capacity to continue to strive to improve and you, you see value in that, then, you know, who knows what the limits are for all of us. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. All right. No, thanks a lot for agreeing for this chat. No and problem. I'm, I, I'm really proud of the work that you have put in. I know I don't. I Thank haven't you. Like, yeah. It's, it's really amazing what you've done. And I'm going to, you know, try to draw inspiration from this to help as many students as I can and I'm excited to continue to work with you and see what Me we too. can both achieve together. Yeah, for sure. Thanks for watching everyone. And I feel like it's important to say that it, not everyone's journey is going to look like this, just absolutely climbing 1000 LP in such a short amount of time. But I do hope that you can take something from his journey, his mentality, his perspective, take the best parts of it and integrate it into your own so that you can climb uh, as well as possible on your own personal journey.
to get coaching of your own, I'm going to leave some links in the description below. My Patreon link provides a group uh, coaching session that runs twice a day during the weekday. And then I do run individual coaching sessions, which are longer and more in depth. Um, I'm going to put the link to that in the description below as well. Please consider joining my School of Support Discord community. We are a growing community filled with motivated supports that are all helping each other on their journey. I want to give a shout out to my current Patreons who are helping me make what I do a full-time gig. And I really appreciate your support. Thanks for watching again and goodbye.